Hi, everyone. I'm David Bressler. I'm uh, going to be talking to you today about Enviro DIY in the Delaware River Basin. Going to give some history where we are now and where we're going. Going to provide some um, options for how people can, can get involved and just give a good overall background, hopefully, of the program and where we're going with it. Um, let's just get right into it here. So I'm going to give you an overview of what Enviro DIY is, and I'm going to give you an overview of what Monitor My Watershed is. It's the data portal. Um, and I'm going to go into specifics of the Enviro DIY and the Delaware River Basin Program. Like I said, uh, some of the history, where we're at now, and then kind of where we're headed in the future. So uh, the history certainly is just going to be for context. I'm going to provide some info on resources for uh, folks that are working with these stations. I'm going to give some case studies of, um, that are going to kind of give you some examples of how folks are using the stations and the data. And, um, and then going to give some options for how, how, how folks can get involved. So moving along here, Enviro DIY is a community for do-it-yourself environmental science and monitoring. Enviro DIY is part of the Wiki Watershed Toolkit. Um, the toolkit is designed to help citizens, conservation practitioners, municipal decision makers, researchers, educators, and students advance knowledge and stewardship of fresh water. So here's the EnviroDIY.org page. You can see there's different options for participating info on the Mayfly data logger, which is the centerpiece of Enviro DIY. Um, there's a blog, there's a forum to get help on, there's links to videos for um, learning how to do different things. And then there's uh, GitHub here, which is where all the code and such is available for programming your Mayflies to talk to different sensors. Okay, so here's the Wiki Watershed Toolkit all these different options. Probably a lot of folks have heard of Model My Watershed, um, Monitor My Watershed, as I mentioned, we'll talk more about that. It's the data portal for Enviro DIY uh, sensors. And then you've got LeafPack Network, macroinvertebrates.org, and the Water Quality app. So more on Enviro DIY. As I mentioned, the Mayfly data logger is kind of the centerpiece of Enviro DIY. The, the Mayfly is a, is a data logger um, it's programmable, and it, is, um, it uses Arduino um, software programming. Um, it, the board itself was designed by Shannon Hicks, who is a Stroud Center engineer. She's played a major role in the development of all of this technology, the inventor of most of this technology I'm going to be talking about. Um, but basically, the, the Mayfly uh, is the brains of the of the thing, you program it so that it can talk to any number of different sensors and then it records data and does have the option of transmitting data to the Monitor My Watershed data portal. So um, broadly speaking, um, in terms of Enviro DIY, there's a whole lot of possibilities. As I mentioned, you can program the, the Mayfly data logger to uh, communicate with a lot of different sensors. So just some examples of different um, setups that people have used with the Mayfly data logger. Um, these, are, these are from blogs on the Enviro DIY site. So here's one that was a low cost electrical conductivity sensor. Um, this is a uh, uh, logger used for monitoring in a forest. And then this is a low cost temperature logger, all with the Mayfly as the sort of centerpiece. Um, so these Enviro DIY stations, as you can see, they are have been deployed globally, but mostly they're kind of in the United States and up into Canada some now. Uh, most of the stations are in the eastern US, and the greatest density are in the Delaware River Basin as a result of the um, project that I'm going to be describing today. So. As I mentioned, uh, the Mayfly can be programmed to interact with a lot of different sensors, and then you can sort of set up your whole sensor station or monitoring station, as we call them, um, <clears throat> in any different number of uh, configurations that works for you. What I'm going to describe now is kind of a it's 
standard setup that we're using in the Delaware River Basin. Um, you can see this is the, the on land component, solar panel, a waterproof logger box. This is inside the logger box. You have a battery. There's your Mayfly. There's your cell board to connect uh, to the internet. And um, these are the sensors that are in the water. Generally, we're using a CTD sensor and a turbidity sensor. This station setup is also designed by Shannon. So here it is, um, the full picture of it. You can see the station on land, and then you can see these sensors that are on kind of a bundle, it fits onto a rebar in the stream, wire leading from the, from the logger into the stream. Um, here's a close up of inside the logger box. You can see here the solar panel is connected in here and is charging this battery. Close up, you can see the battery hooks into the <clears throat> Mayfly. You see the um, <clears throat> cell board here with antenna. And you can see these wires coming out here connecting into the uh, sensors that are then leading to the stream. Um, here's some specifics on the Mayfly data logger. I'm certainly not going to go through all these. But some um, main features this is your SD card slot um, where you're logging data to the, to the board. Here's kind of like the um, center brains area, on off switch. And as I mentioned, here's your connectors to the sensors, your connectors to the solar panel and battery. Um, <clears throat> here's a close up of the cell board. It's transmitting via 4G LTE signal. We were uh, transmitting via 2G signal for a number of years, but that's sort of been phased out and we're now working with the 4G LTE um, capacity. And as I mentioned, this, the data are transmitted to monitor my watershed. Okay, um, here's the <clears throat> sensors in stream. You can see the CTD, CTD sensor conductivity, temperature and depth turbidity sensor, which measures the uh, cloudiness of the water. Just some different angles to show the setup attached with a hose clamp. You can see here um, the sensors are attached to a PVC um, pipe, which is then inserted over a piece of rebar, which is driven into the stream bed. This pin then allows you to remove the sensor bundle as a whole and then return it to the exact same depth. Here's a closer look at the individual sensors. Here's your CTD sensor. You can see this uh, white pressure transducer here. It's thin ceramic, it uh, can be damaged. So um, that's kind of an important thing to consider when you're uh, cleaning the sensors. You certainly don't wanna damage this. And this is, seems to be the thing that breaks most easily from um, damage during storms primarily. Um, See these screw heads here, these four screw heads, that is where the conductivity is measured from this sensor. These get fouled, can affect the data. And then this is the eyeball um, of the turbidity sensor that shoots out into the, um, <clears throat> into the water, about 12 to 15, or 15 to 18 inches. And so you can imagine that that can get fouled. Uh, algae can grow on this. You can get sticks and leaves that cover it up and that's all gonna affect your data. Um, as I mentioned, there's uh, data are recorded on SD card and also transmitted to monitor my watershed data portal. This data portal, um, the SD card is going to be generally the most secure data. If you lose connectivity via the cell signal, data will uh, continue being logged to the SD card. Um, data. On, on these standard stations are be re being recorded every five minutes. Um, <clears throat> you can see the different, excuse me, you can see the different parameters being logged every five minutes here, conductivity, temperature, depth. Uh, this is temperature of the Mayfly board, battery level, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> data points are collected every five minutes and generally sent to monitor my watershed. Um, the 4G cell signal. So data are coming from here, being transmitted via cell signal to the uh, publicly accessible online data portal, monitor my watershed. You can see here data um, sites are on a map with uh, a legend describing how recent data are. 
You can check these data panels, which give the real time feed of the data, 72 hours worth of data. And then you can go into the time series analyst to overlay parameters on one another or overlay different sites on one another and look at the data history. And I'll get into some more of that in, uh, in a couple more slides. So as I mentioned, Monitor My Watershed is one of the other uh, wiki watershed tools. So we'll describe a little more about that. Here is the website. It is publicly accessible. You can log in. You can set up a user account, but you don't have to. Um, <clears throat> Browse sites is a good way to just get to the map. This will take you directly to the time series analyst. So if I click Browse Sites, it takes you into this clickable map, which uh, your legend here basically tells you how recent your data are. So all these dark green are li essentially live data that will be transmitting every five minutes. And then so you can keep track of how, um, how recent data are and whether your station is live or not via this nice um, color-coded legend here. Um, and then once you click into a site, you can go to these, you'll, these data panels will come up. And you can look at real time, the real time data. So this is the most recent data uh, that will be shown here. And these panels, these uh, panels that are on the main uh, each site's main page, are uh, quite viewable on a smartphone. So that's super useful when you're going out into the field and want to be able to look at the data live while you're out there at the station, checking, you know, if you're what your cleaning did or checking against, um, you know cross checks for quality control. Um, these three tabs here, you can download data here. This will show you a 72 hour plot of this. This will take you to the time series analyst. Um, within time series analyst, you can, as I mentioned before, you can overlay different variables. Here we have conductivity, temperature, and depth. So you can see them laid out here. It gives you um, the legend of what you're displaying here. These axes are, uh, you can zoom in on these with your mouse. You can zoom in on this axis with your mouse. mouse. You can adjust the time range here. So default ones last week, last month, or all, where you can put in, put in custom ranges for the data. And then here you have summary stats. So whatever one is highlighted here is gonna give you the summary stats for that particular parameter. So here we have the summary stats for water depth here. So I'm going to move from that into some general concepts to kind of just give you an idea of the types of um, ecological um, patterns that can be uh, shown with the data from these stations and as displayed and monitor my watershed. So um, water temperature we're looking at here, you can obviously see seasonal trends in water temperature. You can see the variability day to day. Uh, through there in this plot, and then you can zoom in on this more and see the general fluctuations from day to day. Moving on, um, another common pattern that we see is dilution of ions within the stream. So every stream has a certain natural level of conductivity, whether that's from uh, the, the surrounding geology um, or whether it's uh, due also to uh, inputs such as road salt and other kind of contaminants that come from urban landscapes. Regardless, you have a conductivity level um, that when stormwater enters the stream, stormwater is usually um, much more dilute than stream water. So you can see that the ions dissolved in the stream water become very diluted during storms. That's a typical pattern that we see in these streams, um, especially in non-winter months. In winter, if there's snow, you'll often see spikes in conductivity, and I'll get into that a little bit as well. Um, just a note here, this is Naylor's Run, which is an urban watershed, and you can see high conductivity. So you're getting actual ranges of conductivity, but you know, our general natural range in this region is you know, under 100 to up to mid 200. So when you're getting into the 600 range, that's clearly showing um, contamination. So here's our uh, example of conductivity spikes in the wintertime. Usually these are 
um, where often these are due to uh, road salts and de-icers being flushed into the stream during and after storms. So you can see here a correlation between a little bit of depth increase and these increases in conductivity. And you can see that they're headed way up into um, clearly uh, levels that are going to be detrimental to stream organisms and to drinking water. Uh, this stream shown here is the Cobbs Creek near Philadelphia. So it's just carrying, you know, when a storm comes, comes um, and the salt is put, thrown down, um, starts melting, all that salt is just carried into the stream and you see it in these spikes in conductivity data. Um, we also see changes in conductivity due to unknown things. Um, miscellaneous pollutants, sensor fouling can do this or just general malfunction, but it speaks to the need to, to pay attention to data. Um, you know, and the Monitor My Watershed portal is super useful for that because it shows you the data in real time so you can see when things are changing. You can get out there to check on things. You don't have to wait until you go out and download data and see a pattern weeks or months after it has happened. Um, so, but we see these types of patterns and you don't necessarily know if they're real or if they're fouling or if it's sensor malfunction. So it's often good to go out and cross check with handheld meters uh, to confirm uh, data that you're seeing online and for, that are from, this, from the station. Here, this is a forested stream. And so we're seeing an increase in conductivity, which is very unexpected because it's pretty much an entirely forested watershed with very little pollution. So this was a question. And I think actually this is sensor malfunction. Um, another uh, typical trend we see is um, streams getting dirty in storms. And that is reflected in turbidity. So you can see here a clear correlation between water depth and turbidity. Turbidity uh, here goes up to 90 or 100. Uh, you'll often see turbidities going 300 or more during severe storms. Uh, fouling with these particular turbidity sensors is an issue. So upkeep can be um, pretty, you have to be pretty diligent about that to get good turbidity data at times. Um, so that, those are just some examples of uh, data patterns that we see, just to give you a little bit of um, flavor of that. So moving on, I'm going to talk now uh, more specifically about the Enviro DIY and the DRB program. So as I mentioned before, I'm going to give, you, give some history, talk throughout about resources that are available. I'm going to return to that several times just to, because there's a lot there, so kind of just making that known. I'm going to go through some case studies, just touching on some case studies, and then um, <clears throat> talk about uh, options of how folks can get involved. Okay, so a lot here. 2007 to 2018, Stroud Center was, was granting stations via, via the Delaware River Watershed Initiative uh, to groups throughout the Delaware Basin, um, and we started laying a foundation of support resources. In 2018, 2019, this was sort of a transition period of really nailing down um, and updating guidance materials. So there's a, a, a comprehensive manual, there's field data sheets, uh, there's videos and guidance materials like quick guides are a pretty useful item there. We're doing continue, have continue to do workshops from the beginning and trainings and continuing throughout to do on-site assistance and direct one-on-one -on -one consultation and support. We developed this uh, resources page, which uh, I'm gonna reference this multiple times just so that it's well known that this is a page you can go to for a lot of different resources. And then um, <clears throat> more recently, we've kind of been stabilizing things and planning for the future. Uh, we've started doing a standard Enviro DIY CTD build workshop in which we walked folks through building a station from scratch um, using this uh, monitoring kit as a starting point. And then um, Monitor My Watershed has been upgraded. It's still um, kind of in, in a developmental phase. Uh, it's certainly fully functional, but there are certainly plans now and in the future to build it out, uh, along with a lot of other different resources. One other thing to mention, 
I already did this, but one of the main uh, kind of focus areas that Stroud has um, has has been focusing on is um, just providing technical support. These stations are like babies, and they just need constant, pretty much constant attention. They are automated and they do collect continuous data, but the out there in the wild, they you know there's all kinds. You see the storms that we have. And those can do damage, and um, so you have to pay attention to them. And so uh, we encourage groups to monitor things closely. But Stroud Center continues to provide technical support for problems that are um, pretty uh, pretty difficult to solve. So um, just a little bit on the Delaware River Watershed Initiative. Th this is our main funding source for being able to provide to provide the, so the, the support that I just mentioned. Certainly feel free to go to this website and check out more about the Delaware River Watershed Initiative or DRWI. Um, this is uh, the Enviro DIY program is certainly just one small component of DRWI. There's a lot of other stuff going on within that. And that is a William Penn Foundation funded project. Uh, Seesaw. Consortium for Scientific Assistance to Watersheds. We also have been able to provide support to station users in Pennsylvania via this program. Um, <clears throat> so a little more on the history here, where have we come from. Uh, in 2017, via DRWI, the Stroud Center uh, began supporting the Enviro DIY uh, program in the DRB. Um, a little bit repeating here, but we developed a We've done a lot of different workshops, um, guidance materials like this manual, um, and these quick guides I mentioned are, I think, pretty useful. Um, a lot of good guidance videos are available. We have this uh, field visit data sheet that we encourage folks to fill out whenever they, they visit stations to document it. And this is a, there is an online data entry for this, as shown here where you can fill this hard copy out and enter it online. And then it's, then it's available to, to you in the future and anyone else. You can also access a spreadsheet of all of your data entries. Um, there, we have a new service request form that folks can fill out to uh, ask for assistance from Stroud Center technicians like Shannon Hicks and Rachel Johnson. And um, that sort of goes towards this idea here of just our technical support um, often will meet folks out there um, to kind of go over and, and do a little bit of a tutorial or, tr or, or training while we're um, fixing things so that um, we're not only keeping the stations functioning, but trying to build capacity, trying to teach people how to um, use these stations. And it's pretty much never ending. It's a, it's a deep well in terms of um, all the information that you can learn in association with these stations. And then, um, as I mentioned before, continuing to build out, monitor my watershed and uh, teach folks how to use that uh, in the most strategic ways. So <clears throat> who is the we in all of this? Who, who are all the groups that are involved? You can see a wide variety of groups. It's a lot of watershed groups, K through 12 schools, middle school and high school primarily and then universities, all involved in this. Here's, a, here's our current list. Groups like Valley Forge, Trout Unlimited, other Trout Unlimited groups, pretty prominent. Uh, nature Conservancy, a number of different Nature Conservancy groups involved. Um, universities like East Stroudsburg University, um, uh, Villanova, Lafayette, and then schools, independent school, um, Montgomery School, Westchester University, another university. So uh, our, our vision essentially very broadly is just to make all of this technology and monitoring uh, using Enviro DIY easier for folks um, via all of these resources that we're putting together. And this is simply to, so that folks can understand, analyze, and apply the data for whatever reason they may have, management, education, outreach, et cetera. Um, what we're doing here in the Delaware River Basin is kind of a pilot of what could happen uh, more broadly. And in fact, uh, Trout Unlimited is already um, 
following this, this sort of general kind of template and doing the same type of stuff using this standard station that Shannon designed, putting stations out um, in different parts of the country. They're kind of right now focused in Michigan, but um, moving out a bit more broadly. So we're working pretty closely with them. Um, more specifically, our goal in the DRB, um, primary goal is to support station owners and managers and volunteers in just using the stations for their own purposes. Um, secondarily, we are conducting internal analyses of the data and um, also kind of pro one of our prominent goals is to develop um, kind of the tools to better uh, apply the data and, and give better context within the watershed. So, so providing resources that folks can use to um, better understand and apply the data. So again, sort of these general logistics that, we're, um, that we have to support this vision, workshops and trainings, all these guidance materials, standard data sheets, technical support and assistance, and the data portal. Um, so uh, a little more on the history here. Uh, how is it that Stroud was able to, to provide this resource? Um, and I've alluded to this, but it's pretty much because of technology development um, by Shannon for over 20 years now. You can see some of the past versions of these kind of Enviro DIY type um, tools or gizmos or um, whatever you wanna call it. Here's different versions of the Mayfly board and different attachments, that, uh, kind of different additional um, supplemental boards that, that were used to kind of do what the individual Mayfly boards do now. And uh, Shannon is in, fact, is in fact working on a new upgrade to the Mayfly currently, which will be available soon. Um, and as it turns out in 2015-16, Shannon was really getting to a point of kind of getting, getting this whole setup standardized to a point that it could be tech, uh, available to the, uh, to the public. So that's how we sort of moved in the direction of making these, these standard stations available more broadly outside of the Stroud Center. Prior to that, um, the technology was really just used internally at the Stroud Center for Stroud Center's own internal research. So you can see here the start, you know, kind of an example of what it meant making these publicly available, selling these on Amazon, et cetera. Lots of boards coming in. Shannon tests each one of these before she sells them. Um, Enviro DIY itself, Anthony Oftenkamp, who's now with Limitech, was with the Stroud Center for years, and Shannon kind of uh, came up with the idea of virodiy.org, um, <clears throat> kind of just an open source access to technology and the Mayfly board and code to program the Mayfly. The original data portal was Dream Hosters. This was a publicly accessible uh, option for do, kind of doing kind of custom data receival online. So we went with that for the first several years and uh, transitioned over to Monitor My Watershed, which is still in development, but it is pretty highly functional at this point. And it will continue to be the long-term data portal, very potentially integrating other components of the Wiki Watershed Toolkit into this as well. Um, <clears throat> so where are we now? I'm gonna talk about these items support, give you some statistics on um, number of stations and data points and such. And then go into some other ideas about um, QC and station support and usage and management and such. So right now we are at over 100 stations in the Delaware Basin owned by over 50 groups. Most of these stations are on small watersheds. So median size is about 10 kilometers squared. Um, <clears throat> This is much smaller than the USGS station, than most USGS stations. So it gives us kind of a unique data set. Um, so again, the support materials that are available, I'm repeating myself here, but I don't think that's gonna hurt because this is a long presentation and there's a lot of information. 
field data sheets for collecting information, documenting information, the comprehensive manual, videos, lots of different videos here available, workshops, um, this online resources. I'm going to click into this in a second. Um, we do have an online group and our ongoing assistance and troubleshooting. There's Rachel Johnson, Shannon Hicks, Krista Reeves. Krista is a part-time Stroud technician, works with the Musconetcon Watershed Association, helps with technical troubleshooting up in the northern part of the Delaware Basin. Um, <clears throat> we've been having success lately with group-to-group -group support, so uh, that capacity building seems to be paying off with other groups outside of Stroud being able to support one another. So certainly continuing to uh, build on that in the future. So I'm going to click in here now to this resource. Um, <clears throat> what we have here are drop down menus of all of the different resources available. Here are the data sheets, uh, tutorials on the data sheet, blank data sheets for printing. Here's your data entry of the data sheets. Um, here's a lot of different help resources linked to the manual. Here's all the different quick guides. This is a recommended management and responsibilities um, outline for designating responsibilities. Um, <clears throat> a lot of other help resources in there. Here's that sensor request or that request form, some support supplies. Um, a lot of other things in here. Uh, I'm going to get into some of these in a little bit. So let's go back to the presentation. Um, if I can. Stop here, sorry. Let's just stop share. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so then there's, a, there's you can access this. There's a help tab there. I'm not going to go into that right now because we don't have enough time. And then we've got the EnviroDIY.org website. Um, within this help tab on Monitor My Watershed, there's a, a manual and quick guide and videos on how to use Monitor My Watershed. Um, okay, so some stats here. 55 stations went out in 2017, 35 in 2018, 25 in 2019, 12 in, in uh, 2020, and uh, four in 2021 so far. This has de decreased because we granted a lot of these stations in this range. These stations from here on out have been folks who are building the stations themselves. We are no longer granting stations. We are only supporting folks in building stations on their own. Um, <clears throat> We'll get into that a little bit. A lot of data points out there. Um, over 227 million data points collected so far every five minutes for all these parameters. Um, <clears throat> so you can see a number of groups have quite a few stations out there. Paul Wilson East Stroudsburg has seven stations measuring um, different points on Cherry Creek. So a little info there on just stations per group. Um, a lot of station visits. So folks have been keeping up with maintaining the stations, over 3,000 uh, visits to the stations by, by volunteers and, uh, and professionals as well uh, in maintaining the stations, about 900 quality control visits and over 350 troubleshooting visits by the Stroud Center in just the last couple of years. Uh, so here's some examples of the work that's being done by the different groups, Musconet Kong Watershed Association, working with uh, wastewater treatment plant effluent and looking at temperature and brook trout among other things. Um, First State National Historic Park and Delaware Nature Conservancy looking at pollution into the national park. As I mentioned, Paul Wilson at uh, East Stroudsburg University working with the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, Poconos Kittatinny Cluster, also employing the stations into his classwork. Um, 
the watershed hydrological analysis team looking at stormwater and sediment um, <clears throat> flowing into uh, some of the streams in southeastern PA. Uh, White Clay Wild and Scenic kind of doing some municipal uh, work. Um, and then I'm going to describe this watershed characterization case study that, that we did along with the Wall Kill uh, group and the Pat Kong groups. Pollens Kill, uh, Delaware, Na or excuse me, New Jersey Nature Conservancy working on the Pollens Kill, looking at temperature and sediment. Um, Bash on the Basha Kill, uh, the Deer Park Rural Alliance is looking at uh, pollution from Dragon Springs development there. Um, Broadhead Watershed Association looking at Forest Hills Run, kind of sleuthing salt inputs and municipal infractions. Westchester University um, has been involved with this. We'll talk a little bit about that in a case study. And then another example of uh, good uh, usage of stations, Primrose Creek Watershed Association has been doing some monitoring of a uh, <clears throat> quarry that has been altering flow to Primrose Creek. So let me get into it, some specifics on these case studies. Um, <clears throat> so these, uh, Nature Conservancy of Delaware and Pennsylvania has six stations positioned in the first state national historic park. Um, their stewards, their stream stewards are monitoring these and they've seen some real um, extreme salt spikes on some of these streams. This is from uh, Rocky Run. Uh, this is one of the stewards, Jeff Chambers. And this was, this is a salt bag found by the stream, ironically. Um, but you can see that some of these salt spikes are um, and there, as it happens, that was just Jeff Chambers calling me. Imagine that, that's so weird. Um, <laughs> so, uh, these spikes are getting up to seawater level salinity. So th these are patterns that haven't necessarily been really seen until uh, in this region until there's been this continuous monitoring, because you can see it's a quick spike. So if you just went out and collected a sample, even if you collected it here during the salt flush, you would not even come close to describing the peak of where that salt went. Um, <clears throat> so what, uh, Jeff and others with the stream stewards have done is they've gone upstream of that station to monitor and to try to figure out uh, where the elevated conductivity is coming from, where those spikes are coming from, and where even base flow conductivity is coming from. You can see that these base flow levels, when it's not being diluted by storms, are very high in the seven to 800 range conductivity, which is way above natural conditions. Um, so this is another stream steward monitoring the pipe coming out of this concrete channel. The mall is right here. So this is parking lots here. These are draining from under the mall. So measuring, taking measurements of individual pipes at all these different stations leading up along, or these different locations leading up along Mall. This is the scent. this is the monitoring station here. So trying to figure out where these sources of pollution are along here. Just going out with a meter like this, and then kind of measuring different inputs. There was even a lateral gradient here. This is a development on this side. This is with grass and such, and this is the mall here with just pure concrete over here. There's actually a gradient laterally too here with higher conductivity this side than this side. Um, and I just thought I'd include this. This was not staged. This red crayfish was crawling up the middle of this um, concrete channel. You never know what you're going to see out there. Um, another case study here looking at unknown uh, spikes that were coming at regular intervals on uh, Pickering Creek at the Montgomery School. Um, some master watershed stewards, Carol Armstrong being one of them went out and tried to sleuth this issue with the online data, you were able, you're able to kind of time it so you can try to go upstream and figure out where these spikes are coming from. Unfortunately, the spikes stopped before they were able to determine where the, um, the pollution was coming from. Um, there's another case study, the East Stroudsburg University situation where Paul Wilson has put out multiple stations on Cherry Creek uh, longitudinally here. 
And one of the patterns that is seen is uh, decrease or increasing temperature going downstream, but then some outliers where um, one of these is uh, cooler down here than upstream. So why is that? It's unknown. My guess is there may be limestone springs coming in cooling the water. But general idea here of longitudinal monitoring um, to look at uh, how the stream is changing as it flows downstream. Turbidity has also been shown here to be increasing during storms going downstream. So here's Paul also using the stations in his classes, both undergraduate and graduate students in clubs, classrooms, and, and students doing individual research as well. There's a kind of field group there. Um, <clears throat> So kind of teaching folk, students how to do basic kind of um, uh, maintenance and upkeep, but also teaching how to do uh, station building and such. And then presenting research uh, in, um, in, in uh, university venues. And overall purpose here being to, to get real life experience to, um, to the students. So another case study here from uh, Westchester, PA, Patty Haug, who was a uh, master watershed steward and graduate student at Westchester, George Seeds, a local master watershed steward, and Elizabeth Rushman, who's a Conestoga High School student, is also presenting here at the, at the uh, Watershed Congress on some of this work. So there's Patty and George um, doing some flow measurements here to develop a rating curve, linking depth to discharge. Um, there's the five stations in Westchester. And just some of the stuff that we're finding by having, having uh, these stations in one area is showing how um, the stations vary in a small region that's kind of all developed, but certainly seeing some of the streams that are in the more developed portions of the, um, of the watershed, this one and this one here, are the two that are the highest base level conductivities. So they're draining the most paved and asphalt urban areas with the most roads, all of these stations are well above natural conductivity conditions. So they're all contaminated with road salt and other things most likely. Um, <clears throat> and also showing, showing these five streams in one small area, it also gives us a view of um, how these wintertime spikes vary. So you can see different timing that presumably relates to how quickly the water is making it, the water from the roads and parking lots is making it to the streams via stormwater infrastructure. And, um, and then we see also like some of these streams have long extended levels of elevation, which are, which are gonna mean these streams are probably gonna have um, more exposed toxicity to organisms in these streams. Um, so I mentioned Elizabeth Rushman, um, who is presenting uh, some details on this study she did, but she did something similar to um, what I described with the, the stream stewards in, uh, in the Nature Conservancy, where she did longitudinal measurements going upstream from the, from the monitoring station to try to figure out where these uh, uh, sources of contamination are and to what extent they are happening at. Um, this is on the east branch of Plum Run. Um, and so this is just a few of the results she found. So showing that all of these sites going upstream, so this, these are uh, the furthest, these are the stations closest to the monitoring station, and these are the ones that are the furthest up. So these are the ones that are closest to the urban land. And you can see that all of these stations are far exceeding uh, natural conductivity levels. Um, Elizabeth also monitored chloride via chloride strips and is showing some um, definite exceedances in these headwater areas, actually, of uh, chloride levels. These, are, these here are state level and, and federal level chloride limits. So there are definite exceedances there. And she's also shown that um, these uh, levels have doubled in the past 15 years and show, showing also delinea delineating the watersheds associated with each of these points moving upstream. So you can see these headwaters are gonna have more urban land use 
uh, in their smaller watersheds. And you can see a direct, pretty tight correlation between conductivity and urban land use. So the hypothesis that urban land was contributing to these conductivity um, levels is certainly looking true and the fat and also confirmation that salt is the likely contributor. So another uh, case study here, I mentioned this already, but a watershed characterization that Stroud Center collaborated with the Wallkill Watershed Management Group, Christine Rogers and the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. Um, that was Juniper Leifer, I didn't put that in here, but Juniper uh, provided a lot of feedback and support with that. So the idea was this, was to just to, as a kind of pilot um, project to take the data and just look at it and start thinking about um, standardizing methods by which um, these continuous data could be used to uh, provide an overview of watershed conditions. So we looked at um, extended temperature levels in relation to New Jersey um, criteria for temperature. And you can see a number of different exceedances here of temperature. This site, the station is in the headwaters of the pollens kill. So, um, you know, generally considered to be cold water areas, the pollens kill is a trout um, stocked stream. So you would expect the headwaters to be cooler than downstream, but actually it was determined that it was kind of the opposite where the headwaters were the warmest. And <clears throat> headwaters of Pollens Kill also here, much warmer than similar uh, small streams that are in forested, more natural areas. So comparing to known criteria and also comparing to reference type uh, conditions or sites. Um, same thing with conductivity. So conductivity was converted to chloride and then showing here uh, chloride levels, state level chloride levels, 230 chloride, two milligrams per liter, certainly being exceeded for long periods of time. That's the chronic chloride level. So presumably organisms in the stream are being affected during these extended periods of elevated conductivity. And then um, same thing here with conductivity, relating the conductivity of this stream to natural forested streams, again, showing highly elevated conditions compared to natural conditions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that kind of concludes my brief uh, overview of some case studies. So moving on to where are we going and how folks can get involved. I'm kind of running out of time here. So um, <clears throat> these are the four, four basic ways. You can build a station, you can help manage a station, you can just use the data on Monitor My Watershed publicly accessible, and you can just, uh, or you can just get a start or just in, in, in uh, concert with these items, you can attend monthly meetings, workshops, and trainings and continue to build your experience. So um, building and deploying stations, methods that you can do that is attend a Enviro DIY build workshop in which um, we walk you through the process of building a station. Um, the next workshop is planned for early 2022. So be in touch with me if you'd like to be kind of put on an early access list for that. You can also build a station just using the manual. The manual is comprehensive and will walk you through the entire process. There's also tutorials um, to, uh, that you can follow. There's a two-day tutorial in there of a two-day workshop that we did, the first one of these uh, building workshops that we did, where you can access that and just basically attend that workshop if you like. Um, so a little more about building, building the stations. Uh, the general way we do it in terms of the workshops uh, is to provide these monitoring kits, which provide everything essentially except um, the sensor and then the equipment that is used to install the station. But this includes the Mayfly, the solar panel, SD card, proper wiring, everything to, uh, to build the station. Then you purchase the station directly from Meter Group. And then, um, Moving on to other ways to get involved, you can help to 
um, manage a station. So there's four basic ways to manage a station. Um, management oversight, this is generally what the owner or manager of the station does. And they basically just ensure that these other uh, tasks are being completed. An important role is desktop monitoring of station function. I alluded to this earlier, but it's very important to pay attention to the data on a regular basis so that you know when things are happening and uh, being able to think about maybe why they're happening. That's generally recommended uh, on a daily basis. So just checking in maybe each morning on, um, is the station live? Uh, do the data look normal? Is there fouling occurring? How does the battery level look? So on. Uh, maintenance, this is an important role as well. Just going out and cleaning the sensors and cleaning vegetation around the logger box, making sure that the solar panel is clear. This is generally recommended once a week. And quality control, uh, doing cross checks to make sure that the data that are coming from the station are accurate. So I'm gonna go through each of those individually a little more. So checking online on monitor my watershed involves going and uh, checking if the stations are live. So you go in here and you can see these two are live. So that's good. These two are recently offline. So what is that? What's happening there? Was the cell plan paid? Did something happen to the station itself? Was it vandalized? Did the uh, cell board break? What's going on? Red, the station has been out of date for a long time. Maybe uh, the station was moved. Maybe it's no longer there actually. Maybe it just hasn't been kept up. Maybe, maybe they aren't paying the, pay the, the payment plan anymore for the cell coverage, but the data are still logging to the SD card. Point being, you check this to keep uh, keep an eye on really what is happening um, on a day-to-day -day basis with your station data and, and its state of transmission. Then you can go into these data panels and confirm, for instance, here battery voltage. Is the battery voltage above 3.5 volts, which is the cutoff at which it will stop transmitting to the data portal? So checking this regularly. Checking things like turbidity and the other uh, the other uh, data types coming in. Turbidity, as I mentioned, fouls a lot. So you see spikes like this, maybe a little fouling there, but um, looks relatively okay here. But you can go in and check, check a data panel like this. And if you see a turbidity of a thousand units or something, it's pretty likely that it's foul. Um, so then you move on to, so that person who may be monitoring uh, monitor my watershed can then communicate with folks who are cleaning the stations, for instance, or doing quality control and say, oh, so-and-so you're cleaning the stations, this station needs, looks like it's fouled, so it needs to be cleaned. So that person could then go out and clean the station, recommended once a week or as needed per someone else identifying or someone identifying that there is a need for sensor cleaning, for instance, or maybe swapping a battery out if the charge is getting low. So, um, you know, cleaning the station can involve going and cleaning debris like this, vegetation like this that can grow up and surround the logger. Going and cleaning the sensors, you get this type of buildup on the sensors, algae growth, sediment deposition, and then you clean them to make them nice and clean. And you get in this slot to make sure uh, to clean those screw heads, which can get fouled. And even if you clean this, this exterior, <coughs> you may not fully clean the interior of those screw heads. So you take these long bristles from the br brush and get them in there to gently clean those screw heads. And then doing quality control to make sure that the data are accurate coming from the station. So you can go out with a calibrated handheld meter and check conductivity and temperature. And then you can manually check depth by measuring with a metric ruler from the pressure transducer up to the water surface and making sure that those measurements match what are showing up online, whether coming from the station. And if they don't, if they're outside of a 10% error range or so, then you need to think about, well, what's the problem? Okay, so another use of the stations is just using the data and the resources for outreach, education, management, et cetera. Um, considering things like flooding risk, okay? If it gets Montgomery School um, was using the station depth to, to determine when their bridge would be, would be covered 
by water from flooding. Um, thinking about things like this freshwater salinization syndrome and tracking how, uh, how different streams are relating to um, natural levels or criteria. Um, <clears throat> and then another point here, as far as using the data, um, certainly monitor my watershed is very usable in the classroom setting. There's a lot of different things that you can do with students. Here we are developing lesson plans, um, which you can find on the resources pages as well. Um, and you can design your own lesson plans, certainly, just based on uh, patterns that you may think are going to be interesting to students and based on your pool of students. Um, so, and another thing you can do to get involved is just continue learning, you know, attend these monthly meetings. Um, there is, they are recorded and are on this DRWI with the watershed page. This is the tab under which they're, they're linked and all the recordings are there. Um, and certainly you can attend workshops and trainings. Um, some of the types of trainings that we've done are these build workshops. We had a support workshop in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in June of 2020. Actually, that was June of 2021. Um, but um, more broadly speaking with this slide, we're uh, and moving towards where we are going, we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're, uh, new Mayfly board, um, there's gonna be new cell boards, new sensors coming out from the, um, the, the companies providing code to program those to talk with the Mayfly, updating manual and guidance materials, um, continuing to provide the monitoring kits on the Enviro DIY site, and continuing with on-site training. Um, so just wanted to go in here quickly uh, to demonstrate the um, recording. So just looking under here, you see all of the recordings that are available from monthly meetings. And then you can go under this tab to get recordings of past uh, workshops. So you can see this troubleshooting workshop here. Um, so let me go back to my presentation if I can. Here we go. And then moving on. Um, so longer term planning of where we're going. As I mentioned before, we're developing ways to support groups and using the data. So developing ways to summarize continuous data uh, for rapid assessment of stream conditions, kind of along the lines of that watershed characterization, but, but uh, possibly coming up with um, better stats that describe conditions better. Um, so developing mechanisms to, to apply the data for management, that's something we're just thinking about as far as like supporting groups and really applying this data at the management level and, and coming up with direct kind of mechanisms that uh, can be standardized for groups to be able to do that, to really make the data more and more usable uh, in the community and in terms of uh, watershed management. So, uh, and also building out Monitor My Watershed uh, to include things like data correction and quality control associating metadata with the uh, individual sites, so field visits and uh, photographs and stuff like that. And then, as I mentioned, putting in some more key statistics, such as uh, different what we call metrics that would be related to, to different thresholds that can, that can be used to um, really characterize, better characterize uh, impairment levels and uh, stream integrity in these streams. And then developing um, <clears throat> tools and monitor my watershed to actually be able to convert data using rating curves. So for instance, converting depth to discharge or conductivity to chloride via rating curve equations. Um, <clears throat> so very quickly, this is just kind of a last, just overall very broad lessons learned from the last several years about um, working with these stations. So we certainly suggest that anyone who's working with these stations get familiar with the Mayfly logger and the sensors. If you're, clean, if you're gonna clean sensors, make sure you understand how the sensors function. Um, using Monitor My Watershed to track station function is very important. So paying attention on a daily basis to your station is super important. And, and, and to that end, 
being fluent in the usage of Monitor My Watershed is very important, I think, for anyone who really wants to be involved in working with these stations. Cleaning sensors and doing quality control is the only way to really ensure that you have good data. If you don't clean the sensors and don't do quality control, you're going to have no way to confirm that your data are even accurate if you end up using them in any way. Um, people are super important. Um, these stations, like I said, are really need upkeep and maintenance and regular, consistent, reliable um, attention. So folks who are gonna be proactive and reliable and, and really try to learn about the process and can do specific tasks reliably are gonna be, are gonna be very important. Um, we have certainly have found that, that groups that have schedules and have people assigned to specific roles and responsibilities have been effective. Um, additionally, Certainly, it has appeared to us that the, that the groups that are really in regular dialogue with the Stroud Center team, who attend meetings, who attend workshops, are the ones who have the best data, who have the stations that are the most um, reliable and the most um, durable, even, uh, are the folks who have been really active in seeking out help and in also uh, making use of the guidance resources available. Backup funds are definitely important. Stroud Center has been able to support uh, replacements and um, uh, stuff like that, but it certainly is good to have backup funds if you're a station owner to deal with, um, deal with problems as they come up. And possibly most important before you put a station out, really have a good idea of how you're gonna use the data. Just, you know, it's your own situation, so, but know how you're gonna use the data and, um, and certainly keep learning about the data and connecting it to the watershed management issues if you're in, working in that realm. And think about ways that you can help build the knowledge within the Enviro DIY community. So if you're learning something, think about presenting it at a, at a workshop or, or, or at a meeting or writing it up in a blog or a forum. Um, so one final thing to mention, we're sort of in this phase of this um, new inventions <laughs> curve. Um, you know, we're, we're still working out kinks. Things are still being developed and made easier and more accessible and user-friendly. So, um, you know, the folks who are getting involved really are the folks who are, are gonna be, are, are, are really understanding that, that this is the position we're at and it's not a necessarily a typical citizen science effort where you can just work on something for an hour a month and kind of feel like you're understanding what's happening and, and be contributing in a valuable way. Folks who are involved in this really um, need to be prepared to spend a lot more hours than that. Probably four to six hours a month is really what is necessary to be involved with things like sensor cleaning, uh, monitoring, monitor my watershed, doing quality control, that type of stuff. Um, so if you would like to get involved in uh, this program, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, this, uh, I'll put, I can put you on this email distribution list. I, I send out reminders about these monthly meetings and workshop updates and general updates um, about things that are happening in the network. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I'm not sure how my time is. I may have to redo this entire recording if I've gone over too badly. Um, here's my contact information and thanks very much. <laughs>